Hey church family, welcome to K-Life Online. Like you, I hate the reality that we cannot gather together as a community for worship in person. Believe me, I know, our online worship experience is definitely not ideal. But please know, you are loved. You are valued. You are prayed for. We will get through this pandemic together. But until then, we pray that our online worship experiences are a safe space for God to show up and breathe life into you right where you are. This Sabbath, we are again excited to celebrate our new lead pastor, Andrea Jacobson. In the midst of this pandemic, Andrea and her husband, Michael, have made the transition to Ohio. And today she will be preaching her second message in the series called, I Got It All Wrong. I can't say how wonderful it is to have Pastor Andrea here sharing her love for God with all of us through these messages. Please continue to join us all in prayer for Andrea and Michael as they begin their new ministry with us here at Kettering. And let's help them feel welcomed and loved by dropping them a quick message in the chat or by sending them a blue card. Many of you have become fans of our weekly podcast called Kettering Connect. You can find it on all of our social media outlets, including the hub at KetteringAdventist.org. Last week, we started something a little different. Rather than using the podcast to look forward to the upcoming sermon, we flipped the script and made it an opportunity for you to engage with each week's message through asking deeper questions that may come to your mind as you listen. You have the opportunity right where you are to ask a question about today's message. Maybe you would like to ask a question or simply seek more clarity on a specific point. To submit your question, go to the bottom of the Be Home Church page on the Hub. This Sabbath, August 15th, immediately following our worship service, we are going to have a family meeting, a conversation on race relations for our Kettering Church community via Zoom. It is clear our world is in pain. Every day we see evidence of a world experiencing the pain of conflict and misunderstanding. But that is not all. We also have family members in pain as well. As a family of God, we believe we are called to have open, honest conversations on these issues, issues that impact everyone in our community. Our goal is to create a safe space of conversation where varied viewpoints and perspectives will be heard and hopefully better understood. To this end, we have members of our own community who have stepped up to be members of the panel that are gonna share their stories and their perspectives and hopefully to foster a healthy and safe conversation. Please join us in this Zoom conversation immediately following service this Sabbath at 1115. The link to access this Zoom meeting can be found on the church-wide email on social media in the link in the description of this video and on the homepage of the hub. With that, my name is Jeremy Winston and this has been your K-Life Update. Welcome to worship. Good morning, everybody. Do you like snakes? I like snakes a lot. In fact, I have my own snake here today. His name is Mr. Pretzel. And he's a very nice snake. He's good-tempered, hasn't bitten anyone yet. But I'm gonna tell you a story about the same two kids we talked about last. Billy and Jake. Now, Billy and Jake, their family decided to go on vacation. So they got in the car. They brought Billy's dog because, as we remember, Jake's dog ran away. And they started driving. And they drove and they drove and they drove until they got to the very bottom of a state called Georgia. And in the bottom of Georgia, it's a swamp. And this swamp, this swamp is called the Okefenokee Swamp. And it's filled with all sorts of different things. It's got alligators. It's got mosquitoes. It's got humans that were bitten by mosquitoes. But it also has a lot of snakes. And Billy and Jake, they were so excited to see the snakes. So the first day they got there, they ran out into the swamp and they started looking for snakes. And they found them, believe me, they found them. They found a lot of them. First, they found a mud snake. Now mud snakes, they have a red belly and a black top and they're so cool looking. Next, they found a black rat snake. They're the most boring snake you'll ever see. They're just black. But the day grew to a close and they went back. And when they told their parents what they were doing, their parents were so worried. They told them never to do that again. It's so dangerous, they could have gotten bit. Billy, he took his parents' warning and he decided, 
you know what, tomorrow, I'm gonna sit. I might get by, bit by some mosquitoes or some other swamp activities. Jake, on the other hand, he was like, ah, whatever. Nothing bad happened to me yesterday. Nothing bad will happen to me tomorrow. The next day came, and of course, Jake, he went out into the swamp. He started looking for snakes. He was gonna prove Billy wrong and that it wasn't dangerous to go looking for snakes. And all of a sudden, he saw a big snake. It was brown, had a white mouth, sitting on a rock, sunning itself. And he said, that's a big snake. Billy's never seen a snake this big. This will prove to him, if I can catch this snake, there was nothing to be worried about. So he went over and he started to go for it. He was gonna grab it right behind the head so it didn't come back and bite him. Started to go in and boom! Got bit and oh, it hurt so bad. And his hand started swelling and it hurt. So he started running back to his parents. And when he got back, his parents were there waiting for him. They had heard him screaming in the woods. And they said, Jake, I thought we told you not to do that. Jake was so ashamed. He knew he had done something wrong, but it just hurt too much to admit it at that point. So what's the moral of this story? Billy, he was fine. He had a nice day. He sat inside. He read a little bit, some good activities and nothing bad had happened to him. He had taken the warning that his parents had given him, and he had followed it. Jake, on the other hand, well, he didn't take the warning, and boy, did he regret it. He got bit by a cotton mouth. His hand swelled up, hurt really bad for like two weeks, and it wasn't a good time. So, when you're given a warning or told about a rule that you didn't know about before, you should follow that rule or take that warning because you never know what bad stuff might happen if you don't. Thank you. Welcome to a church today. If you'd please uh, bow your heads with me. Father, thank you so much for being omnipresent and, and being able to be with us wherever we are. And Lord, we continue to, uh, to worship you from different places all over this country, all over our community. But Lord, we feel your presence and we're so thankful and we want to continue to ask that you send your Holy Spirit to, uh, to really help us to feel your presence, to feel like a community. But Lord, most of all today, give us the heart of worship so that wherever we are, we are worshiping you with the right mindset and the right heart and just continue to bless our church as we uh, continue to aim to serve you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. We're glad that you're here to worship with us online today. Um, we just want to invite you into the presence of God, and whether it's in your living room or uh, maybe you're sitting out at a park watching this you know, on your phone or something, but we just want to invite you wherever you are, whoever you're with, just take a minute, shake off the stress of this last week, um, whatever has gone on, we want to just take this time to just fill ourselves, fill our cup with the Spirit of God this morning. I heard an analogy earlier this week about somebody knocking into somebody and spilling what was in their cup. And that analogy talking about whatever's in that cup, it's going to come out when we get bumped, when life pushes us, when we have something that comes unexpected and our cup gets spilled. So whatever we put in there is what comes out. And so it's so important for us as a church family to come together intentionally, refilling our cup with joy, with grace, with justice and mercy, so that when we get bumped with life, that that's what flows out. So as we sing this morning, I just invite you to enter into God's presence wherever you are. Every day. 
my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to be Your love made a way to let mercy come in That's when death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace, suffering washes over
All right, so Isaac, come on over here with me. Can we stand together? All right, let's, everyone, is it all right if we just, we're gonna start with prayer, how's that? Dear Heavenly Father, um, this is such an amazing event. Uh, thank you that we could all be here. Thank you for Isaac and for him making this decision. Uh, we just wanna ask that we can all know that your spirit is present through this and that we all know that, that you're blessing Isaac in this decision for you. And in thy name, amen. Isaac, I want you to know, this is an amazing day. It really is to think that you've reached this point. And we talked about this is the start. The Bible was full of all these starts. You had Adam and Eve started off. Then they left the Garden of Eden. They had to restart. Noah restarted everything. But probably the biggest restart was Jesus's life here on earth, was giving all of us a chance to follow him. And, and I guess the really cool thing is through that story, Jesus was baptized. We know that that was an example that he did. He didn't need to be, but he did it as, a, as an example for us. And you're making a step just in your baptism to follow in his footsteps. And we're so proud of you in this beginning. And I believe that God is gonna lead you every day in a deeper relationship with him. Are you ready to walk out in the water and get baptized? Let's go. Dear Jesus, I want to be baptized because I want you to be in charge of my life. I want you to be my savior so that I can have eternal life with you. I love you with all my heart, soul, and mind, and know that you love me too. I want everyone to know about my decision to choose you. Love, Isaac. Isaac, I am proud of you, and I believe that the angels are rejoicing tonight. In, in your decision. And I think you're gonna know that the Holy Spirit is leading you no matter what. Go ahead and grab my hand right here. And then I'm gonna hold this hand up. Here, you hold it like this. And you take this one and you can grab right here. So you can pull it up. I'm gonna take this hand, I'm gonna hold it up. And I'm gonna say, because of your love for Jesus and because of his love for you, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, please lead Isaac from now on in this decision. We love you, and in thy name, amen.
Please bow your heads. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, for Isaac and for Tara and for Bruce and for Colton as they experience just an awesome day for Isaac and his decision to give his life to you. And Lord, we are a community that normally is able to stand all in line and, and, and hug and, and give the thanksgiving of, of such an awesome decision. And Lord, we ask that uh, you send your, your spirit specifically to Isaac, that he is uplifted, that he feels all of our warmth and affection for him. And Lord, there are so many things going on in our community. We, we pray for our local community, those who are being affected by COVID, affected by economic challenges. Lord, we think of the many members of our church that we haven't seen for, for months and that are on our hearts. Lord, we have a lot to be thankful as well. We, we are healthy and we're able to uh, have a wonderful worship experience together. We're thankful that Pastor Andrea and Michael have been able to join our community. Lord, we continue to think of our schools and the challenges that you already know about. Lord, we ask that you be with our enrollments. But Lord, most of all, we ask that you continue to be the driving force in our lives. Lord, bless us. Lord, help us not to forget our calling, and that is to go into the world, into our community, and share your love. And Lord, as we listen to uh, the sermon today, be with Pastor Andrea, open her heart that they may be your words. And Lord, most of all, we ask that you come soon. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I'm so glad that you are joining us again for another part of a series called I Got It All Wrong. It's all about Jonah and especially the God of Jonah. It's this interaction between God and his prophet who he loves and he's pursuing. And that's what God does for all of us. So let's get into the word of God into chapter two today. And before we do that, let's pray. Lord God, I come before you because I need you and I want you to be the one who speaks today. Speak to every single one of us. I pray for your Holy Spirit to just touch us and to teach us. I pray this in your name. Amen. So last time, we left Jonah in the belly of the fish. He was there for three days and three nights, the Bible tells us. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like for Jonah to be in the belly of this fish and for so long? Well, there's a song that was written about this. I'm guessing many of you have heard of this song. It's called In the Belly of a Whale. It was written by Newsboys for the story of Jonah by Veggie Tales. And I want to read you some of the lines of this song because it's describing this experience of Jonah and the belly. And it's, it's called the belly of a whale because it makes sense. The, a whale is the largest sea animal. In fact, I believe it's the blue whale that's the biggest, that's the largest. And there are some anecdotal stories of people surviving inside of a large fish, either a large shark or a whale. From what I read, and I don't know whether it is true, but the story goes that you can survive in an animal like that because you only need a small amount of oxygen because you're mostly unconscious. Well, I want to read you these, these lines of what they describe it was like inside of a belly of a fish. Up to my ears in bitter tears. Can't believe I've sunk this low as I walked the plankton, inner sanctum, got out of Dodge, sailed on a bondless bond voyage. You said north and I had it south. The truth is that in the Bible, he's told to go east and then he goes west, tossed overboard. That's a really large mouth. And then the, the chorus says, I'm sleeping with fishes here in the belly of the whale. I'm highly nutritious here in the belly of the whale. Bad food. Lousy atmosphere. I don't want a bellyache, but how long is this going to take? 
The next verse says, I woke up this morning kind of blue, thinking through that age-old question, how to exit a whale's digestion. And then the chorus comes again. I'm sleeping with fishes here, but there's a variation on the chorus towards the end where it says, I am one of the dishes here in the belly of the whale. They say, I am delicious here in the belly of the whale. I've always liked this song because it's so humorous. It's just full of fun. But I would say that all of us would agree that it is not exactly accurate. And it was probably not fun to be inside of a belly of a fish. I mean, the words that come to my mind are definitely not fun and laughter. The words that come to my mind are darkness and wet and cold, claustrophobia, fear, stench. Definitely not anything pleasant in any way. Well, in chapter 2, Jonah gives us some idea of what it was like to be inside of this belly of the fish. And so I want to invite you to turn with me to Jonah chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter just because it's only 10 verses. And if you're like me and you like old-fashioned Bibles, then I just ask that you pull that out and that you interact with it. If you find something that stands out to you, underline it. If you're on your phone, then highlight it on your phone. I used to have a professor at the seminary who would always say, if you're reading a story that you read before a bunch of times that you feel like you know really well, then imagine that this is the first time that you're seeing it, that you're seeing it, because it helps you to look at it a little bit differently. And so imagine today that this is the first time that you're seeing the story of Jonah with me and just interact with the text. So we start out with verse one. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. This is the way that he describes his experience in the belly. He says, it's like an affliction. I feel distressed, which makes perfect sense. This would have been awful in my mind. Then he describes it again and a little bit differently where he says, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. So he's describing this belly as Sheol. Sheol is just another word for the grave. So he's saying, It's as if I found myself in the grave. I was close to death or I was dead because I was in the grave. Then in verse three, he says, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. He's describing drowning because he's in the ocean and the waves are crashing all around him. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. I find this line super interesting because he says, I have been cast, I have been driven out of your sight. But yet in chapter one, isn't that what he wanted? He was fleeing and specifically says from the presence of the Lord. He knows that he's going away from God. He wants to get away from God. But then when he does get away from God and it feels like he's hidden from God, God is hidden from him, then suddenly he realizes, oh, wait. But that's not really what I actually wanted. In verse 5, he says, The waters surrounded me even to my soul. The deep closed around me. The deep is mentioned twice in this chapter. It's two different words for the deep, but the second one is the one that fascinates me. It's the same word that is used right at the beginning before God starts creating on earth. So I want to read it to you in Genesis 1-2, but let's just start with the first verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we're told that it is without form, so it's formless and empty, 
And the way that it's described is that there is darkness and then lots of water, and that water is deep. And so this same word Jonah uses to describe where he's at. He is in darkness and he's in the depth of the deep. I mean, the lowest that you could get. And it makes sense because he's running away from God. And so he ends up on the bottom. If you watched Kettering Connect, you would have heard Pastor Jason and I talking about this part of there is this progression where Jonah is going down and lower and lower throughout chapter one which is the very opposite of what God really wanted him to do. God came to him in verse two and said, arise, and the word is kum, so go up. And then it says that in in verse two that, okay, Jonah does get up. And so you think that, all right, well, he's gonna do what God wants him to do. But instead, he does the opposite. He flees to Tarshish. And then the progression starts. It says, he went down to Joppa, and then he went down to the harbor. Then he went down into the ship that he paid for. And then again, he goes down into the lowest parts of the ship to go sleep. And then he ends up in (laughs) the lowest part of the sea, in the belly of a fish. The deep closed around me, he says, because that's what happens when we push God away. Then he continues and says, weeds were wrapped around my head. So it's as if they're strangling him. He's being strangled at the same time. And I went down to the moorings of the mountains, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. I imagine these these bars, and whenever I think of bars, I just think of a prison cell. And it just kind of shutting down, just staying there, and you can't get past it because the bars are preventing you from going anywhere else. So it's like he is in prison. Now that he is in the belly of the fish, he can't escape. He would be depressed, I would think. And if we just read the parts that I just read to you, I think we would be depressed too. Because this is a very depressing story of the fact that he's just stuck and in an awful place. But there are things, there are lines that I skipped and I skipped them on purpose and I want to go back to them because these lines show us that God is hope and that within all of these things that are going on and that are happening to Jonah, God is there. So I, so let's start it let's start over and it says I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction and then it says and he God answered me The next part out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you God heard my voice And the next part I was you cast me into the deep and the flood surrounded me and then he says at the end of verse 4 yet I will look again toward your holy temple. He knows that he will find hope in the holy temple, in the temple where God sits. The temple was, is like the white house of heaven, the control center of the universe where God rules and he's sitting on his throne. And because God is there, That's where his hope is. And what's amazing is that he says, I will look again. I will look up toward your holy temple. When he is looking down at everything that is wrong around him, then he will get sucked into his problems. And he had a big problem. But because he realizes that he needs to look up, that's where his hope is. He realizes that there is hope because God is his hope and he's alive and there for him. And then again, just dropping down to the end of verse six, 
He says, even though the earth and its bars close behind me forever, yet you have brought up my life from the pit. So he's describing this experience as a pit. He ended up in a pit that he cannot come out of himself. But God, he says, reaches down and he brought him up and gave him life again. That's who our God is. He is a God who gives life. He's the source of life. And then his prayer ends with these words. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Again, he mentions the holy temple because it is so important for him because he knows that up there, that's where God is. And now he adds this strange little verse, these couple lines that seem almost out of place. And he says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. I'm going to break it down a little bit. So those who regard, the word there is also means to keep or, or guard. So you could say those who hold on to something. Okay, what are they holding on? They're holding on to worthless idols. And the word for idols, there are many words for idols in the Bible. But the one that's used here is the word havel. And it's also used in the book of Ecclesiastes a lot. I mean, just over and over and over. Because King Solomon at the end of his life realizes that everything without God is meaningless, that it's worthless. And so it's this word that can be translated as meaningless or, or worthless, but also as vanity. And it comes from the word vapor. That's what it really means, vapor, nothingness. In other words, so it's saying that those who hold on to worthless nothingness, they forsake or leave behind mercy. And this word for mercy is a word I'm going to teach you just because I'm sure it's going to come up again. And so I want you to start learning it. And the word is chesed. Okay, I want you to say it. Chesed. It's a guttural sound, the, the first sound, chesed. So if you're spitting, then you probably got it right. Okay, so chesed. It is very difficult to translate into English, and that's why you have different Bible versions will translate it differently. It's a, it's a word that's full of meaning, and we cannot use just one word for that meaning. And so that's why you'll see mercy or loving kindness a lot. But to me, the way that I would describe it best is that this word means the fullness of God's love. And so this is this verse, just putting this verse together. It's a, he's saying, those who hold on to worthless things forsake or leave behind this full experience with God. If we hold on to things that distract us, that are of this world, kind of like what Ecclesiastes talks about, we are kind of preventing ourselves from experiencing God the way that He wants us to experience Him and the fullness of His love that He wants to pour out on us. And I believe that to me, this is where the reason why Jonah puts this verse in there is, well, it's twofold. Number one, he realizes that things like that are idols and they cannot save us. They cannot be there for us. Only God can. But also because I believe that he probably realized that this is what he got wrong. That as his life is flashing in front of him, as he knows that he is about to die, he realizes what is important. That it is holding on to God and not holding on to these things of this world that maybe temporarily give us happiness. And that's why he says, but I will sacrifice to you, God, with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed, 
salvation is of the Lord. It is not from any of these things. It is not from things that I make my idols. Salvation only comes from God. He is the one who delivered me. He is my deliverer. That's why Jesus was sent to this earth. That's why Jesus died for us on the cross to give us that salvation. And then chapter two ends by saying, so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. When Jonah found himself in a pit, He cried out to God, and it says that God heard and answered. When you find yourself in a pit, in a place where you feel like you cannot get out of, and all you can see is the problems, cry out to God, because God hears and answers. When I started in the seminary, about half a year later, I suddenly got sick. It just came over me pretty much overnight. And I was trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I went to different people and and nobody could really pinpoint it. I just had the hardest time getting out of bed. It took all of my energy in the morning to get up. I was always in pain, mostly from the bottom from like the middle down. So my legs would just throb all the time. And I felt like I was going crazy. Like my brain just suddenly couldn't keep up. Well, it took several years later when I found out that it was related to Lyme's disease. And for many years, I had struggled through this this pain. But For those of you who have experienced something like that, you have gone through pain, you have been through suffering, you know what it's like, or at least what I'm going to say next, that there are days when you're doing pretty good and you're holding on to God, you're strong. And then there are those days when everything just falls apart in your life and you cannot pick yourself up where you're just stuck in that pit. And all you can do is just focus on everything that is going wrong. And then your mind spirals and spirals and spirals and and everything is bad. Well, I had one of those days. And that evening, I prayed to God. I said, God, I need your help. Of course, I want you to heal me. But I just really need you to show me that you're there and that you love me. Please just encourage me in some way. I need you to answer me. Well, the next morning, I went to chapel at the seminary, and we had communion. I got paired up with a lady who I didn't really know well because we didn't have classes together. And we did our washing together. And then right after that, we knelt down to pray. Well, she prayed for me, and then I prayed for her. And as I started this prayer, there was a verse that just came to my mind. And and it it was just this impression that said, pray this verse for her. Well, I kept pushing it aside because I thought, why would I pray that verse? It has nothing to do with anything, really. And so I just prayed other things. But this verse kept coming to my mind. And the reason why it kept coming to my mind is because the day before, or and I still do this, I went through my verses. I have this little booklet that just has handwritten verses. All of, all of it is full. And I go through those periodically as often as I can, sometimes a lot, especially when there are things going on in my life, and sometimes a little less, more sporadically. Well, I went through these verses the night before, and this was one of the verses that was in it, and that just kept popping into my mind. So I finally said, okay, so as I'm finishing this prayer, I prayed the verse for her. And the verse is Isaiah 30, uh, verse 5. And the verse says, this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. So I said, amen. I look up 
And she's already looking at me. And as, as soon as I look at her, she just grabs onto me. And she says, I can't believe you just, you just prayed that verse. You just told me that verse. This is so amazing. God is so awesome. And then she starts telling me that she has been going through a lot. And then she had prayed that morning. She said, God, I need something. I need you to send me this verse. I need you to show me which way to go in my life now. And if this is where you want me to go, then I need this verse. And she asked specifically for Isaiah 30, verse 15. And as she told me that, I was blown away. Because yes, God answered her prayer, but he also answered mine. He showed me that he loves me that he's using me and that he heard me, that he heard my cry. And he didn't heal me right away. He, it was a long journey of many years. I still have the pain sometimes. But God heard. He heard my prayer and he answered that prayer. If you are lonely because of everything that's going on in our world right now and you just have to stay away from people especially because of a condition in your life. Cry out to God because He hears and He answers. If you feel anxious and worried, stressed out and fearful because of our world, because of things that are going on, Cry out to him because he hears and he answers. He is still sitting on his throne in his holy temple and he hears everything that is going on here. He sees it and he knows when we cry out to him. And every time we cry, he hears and he answers. And his answer may not be exactly what you want. He didn't do that for me. But his answer always has to do with drawing us closer to him. With, and he promises us that salvation. That salvation is ultimately what he wants for us. To be with him in heaven forever to have that close relationship with him forever. If there is something that you need to cry out to God about, cry out, talk to him, tell him everything. Spend time in his word because that's how he answers too. And trust that when you call on God, that he hears you and that he will answer. I'm so happy to have my mother, Jacqueline Brooks Winston, to accompany us on our hymn of response, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Please join us. Trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, precious Jesus, all oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. 
just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that thou art with me, wilt be For grace to trust him more. Lord, help us to trust you, to keep holding on to you, because you hear when we call to you, when we cry out, you hear and you answer. And sometimes it's not about changing our situation. It is about changing us because you want our salvation. You want us to be there with you forever. Thank you for hearing and for answering. Help us to do that this week, to not get discouraged and only see our problems but to focus on you, to keep looking up where your holy temple is, because that is where our hope is. Thank you that you are this awesome God who loves us so much and that you want us to cry to you, to tell you everything. So help us to do that. Thank you for hearing us and for answering us, for being there for us every day of this week. We pray this in your name and put us all into your hands. Amen. And now, some quick, easy discussion questions to help process and apply the message and keep the conversation going. First, have you ever felt like you weren't in a pit and couldn't get out? Second, when you went through a hard time, how did God show himself? Third, how can you hold on to God more instead of worthless things? For more questions to dive even deeper, please check out the Be Home Church page on the hub at KetteringAdventist.org. Thank you so much for joining us at Kettering Adventist Church for worship today. Our mission is to be the church our world needs. If you enjoyed this worship service, we invite you to hit the like button, the subscribe button, and feel free to share the service with others so they can be blessed as well. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.